and, and a particular welcome to Theodora Hoxley, who's going to speak to us. Somebody, somebody said, said to me the other day, what a cool name, she said. <laughs> I think most of you have ever met Theodora in your lives before, so it's, it's great to see you. And as it says in this leaflet, Theodora, she wrote this herself, by the way, as a young, well, you can tell what we're looking at. <laughs> She's a, a young Catholic scholar working at the University of Edinburgh. She's an ecclesiologist. Uh, and she's explained that that's a specialist in church studies, with a particular interest in Vatican II. She's currently working on a project called Peace Building Through Media Arts. <coughs> Come in, John. Um, one of the, the reasons, the original reason I invited Theodora was because I spoke to some people who had heard her at the Living Theology course last year in Edinburgh uh, and spoke very highly of her. And I didn't want all the speakers at this course to be old fogies like me, so I wanted to, I wanted to invite somebody, somebody young, no, no harm to Bernard who spoke at the... <laughs> um, I wanted a different kind of image, so... Um, Theodore is our first attempt at that, so you're extremely, extremely welcome. A lot depends on you tonight, so um, I'm looking forward to hearing what you have to say. I don't often get the chance to come out west, so I'm very grateful to Joe for the invitation. I always feel uh, a little bit silly talking to parish audiences about Vatican II, largely because parish audiences are by and large old enough to remember it. My mother was born in 1960. I am a grandchild of Vatican II. And so my perspective on it is quite different in some ways. So I'll rely on your generosity at the end and correct anything that I've got ethically wrong. So Joe gave me the title, A Modern Church in a Modern World. And the first thing I'm going to do is be a little bit cheeky and change the title by adding a question mark at the end. Does Vatican II give us a modern church in a modern world? Is that what it's aiming to do? Well, in order to answer that, we're going to have to do a couple of things. So first of all, we're going to have to look at the history before the Council, do a little bit of background to see what, what it is that changes at Vatican II. Then we're going to, so we're going to look at something that's called the modernist crisis, which is the Church's response to the modern world. Once we've done that, setting the Council in historical context, we'll look at some key themes from Lumen Gentium, which is the document of the Church, and Gaudium et Space, which is a document on the church and the modern world. And we'll see how they represent a changing understanding of the church itself and a changing understanding of the relationship between church and world. And once we've done that, if we've got time, I'll offer some, some reflections on, on where we are. <coughs> but first of all, we're going to do our historical background and look at the modernist crisis, which is a, a theological movement that happens around kind of late 19th, early 20th century. So what was the modernist crisis? Being a modernist was not thought to be a good thing. So what did these modernists who were around kind of late 19th century, early 20th, what did they think? Well, first of all, they had uh, what was thought of then as a very Protestant and therefore very wrong approach to scripture. They thought that to read the Bible, you didn't necessarily have to go first of all to what it was that the, the early church writers and fathers had said that the scripture said. You didn't have to, to go by their interpretation. You could just read it. It had a voice of its own. Scripture could speak for itself. And they thought that scripture had been written by divinely inspired human beings. So it is truly God's word, but there's also room for some human error, human composition, human work involved in scripture. And they also thought that you could look at the scriptures as historical texts and read them in the same way that you read other historical texts of the period and since. And in a similar way, they took a historical view of dogma. So they thought that our understanding of God's revelation was something that grows, that develops over time. And they recognized that over the course of the church's history, doctrines have developed, they have changed, and that they might do so in the future. And that idea of the development of doctrine, that it's something that's, that's grown and developed, opened the door to, well, perhaps it can grow and develop in the future. 
The third thing they believed in was secularism. Now that doesn't mean that these modernist theologians thought that the church would die out. It means that they thought that there were multiple different groups in society, that society was pluralist, and that therefore there needed to be an arrangement of church and state whereby those groups could all be preserved. A secular state, they thought, was a reasonable solution. And they were also keen on the work of modern philosophers. Traditional Catholic theology is very much rooted in the work of Thomas Aquinas, but these people were reading people like Immanuel Kant, so they were resourcing their theological exploration using different philosophy than had been the case in the past. The photograph I've given you is uh, George Tyrrell, who's a Jesuit, uh, who is condemned as a modernist, and I'll talk about him a little bit more in a minute. Now, some of those things seem quite common sense to us now. I mean, we, we do think of scripture as having its own voice. We know that we can read it and get some sense out of it. And we, we do think of the church's beliefs as staying the same, but also developing through time. And generally speaking, we recognize the value of freedom of religion and separating church and state. But that is not at all the view of Pius X. So in 1907, Pius publishes that first encyclical, Crescendi Domini Regis, which spoke of modernists, modernists as enemies within the church's ranks who pretend to love the church, all the while poisoning it with their doctrines. <coughs> he was not a fan of the modern world, and he was very keen on keeping it out of the church. <coughs> In July 1907, the same year, he published another encyclical called Lamentabili Sane, which is a list of statements about modernism that he thinks are representative of these modernist thinkers that he condemns. And in September 1910, so a couple of years later, he issued an anti-modernist oath. Now this is an oath that has to be taken by the professors, the priests, seminarians, anyone who teaches in a seminary, anyone involved in formation or in, in teaching, being the church's public face. They all have to take this vow, which lists some of these theological propositions and, and affirms that they don't believe them. I, I have heard a story that some theologians in Paris took the oath with their fingers crossed behind their back. <laughs> So there's a kind of paranoia about modernism, which is representative of a paranoia about the modern world more generally and its influence in the church. There was, there was even set up a sodality of Pius X, which was essentially a sort of spy network, really, but, but its aim was to, to spot anybody who showed tendencies of this modernist theology and, and report them. And it had theological casualties too, so people like George Terrell, whose work is condemned, he actually ends up buried in unconsecrated ground for his opinions. But also other people too get tainted with that, that modernist charge. Now before we go on to look about look at how that relationship changed, it's probably helpful to make some more general comments about the relationship between church and world that this modernist crisis is symptomatic of. That attitude to modernism is not just caused by the Pope and the magisterium being one of the old men. That's not what it's about. It's not about them being just anti-progress generally. It's symptomatic of an underlying theological understanding of the relationship between church and world. Now, I don't think you have Bibles on your pews, but if you opened the New Testament and you looked through, and you looked at the number of times that the word world appears, you'd find that it's not always used in a positive way. In fact, it's more often used to signify everything about reality that's opposed to God and the divine plan. So, for example, John chapter 1, we read that the world comes into the world, but the world does not recognize him. Jesus says that he and his kingdom are not of this world. John tells his, Jesus tells his disciples that they don't belong to the world any more than he belongs to the world, and that the world will hate them just as it's hated him. So the world is... In some sense, the same total of all that is opposed to God. Now, those scriptural texts over time become part of the view of the church and the world that is a very anti world on the part of the church. So, the church is thought of a bit like an ark, a bit like a lifeboat. So, the world is evil, it's going to be destroyed in a sort of flood of judgment, and the few people who are going to be saved are, need to be taken into the church and rescued. The job of the church is to get people into the boat and keep them there. 
And we'll see later on that that theology of church and world, like the anti-world center, changes quite a lot in Gaudiamet's space. But it's important to know that despite that kind of anti-world mentality, the paranoia about modernism and the general feeling that the world is something to be kept on the outside of the church, it's not at all the case that the church is just not engaging with the world, that it has its head buried in the sand like an ostrich. It's not that at all. The Pope and the Magisterium were well aware of some developments in the modern world, especially when they impinged on theology and church teaching. They knew what they were, and they didn't like them. It's not true of everything, of course. There are some progressive encyclicals in the period as well, things like Rare and Navarro. But generally speaking, the church actively engages with the world, but in order to keep the world out of the church. The last thing we need to note before we move on to looking at Vatican II is that in the period before Vatican II, there's a strong emphasis on the church not changing. The church is deeply resistant to change. So back in the 16th century, after the Protestant Reformation, the church has responded to these Protestant reformers by saying, no, the true church doesn't change. The true church, the Catholic church, has not changed from time immemorial. We still have everything we've received from the apostles. It doesn't change. The truth doesn't change. If you change, you're just playing wrong. Truth does not change, would not change. There's an Australian ecclesiologist called Richard Manan, and he, he points this out as one of the, the key features of the church before Vatican II. It doesn't change. So, it's a mixed story in some ways before Vatican II. So on one hand, the church is condemning lots of developments that it thought of as modernist, and it understood itself as, as separate from the world and somehow opposed to it. But on the other side, it doesn't cut itself off by any means. It's vigorously engaging with the world, but also insisting that it can't change and it won't change. So what happens then at Vatican II? Does the church bring itself up to date? Well, in order to answer that question, we need to do a number of things. We need to take a look at the intentions of John XXIII and the Council Fathers. What was it that they thought they were doing? How did they explain their mission in calling this council? Did they think they were creating that modern church for a modern world? Then we're going to look at some of those key themes in Gaudium et Spes and Lumen Gentium and pull out how they give us a different picture of the church and a different picture of the relationship between church and world. So what happens at Vatican II? Well, we can talk about three things. A giornamento, plus or small, and a change of language. Have you come across those two terms yet, so far? Some nods, some blank faces. Okay, so a giornamento. John XXIII himself uses this word. He talks about it as an opportunity for a giornamento, which means bringing up to date. It's the Italian word, bringing up to date. He says he wants to throw open the windows of the church and let in some fresh air. And we'll see uh, later on that there's a significant shift in the attitude of the church towards the world. It doesn't think that everything about the world is good, or that the church has a duty to keep up with it, but it certainly opens the windows in that way. It lets in fresh air. It allows people outside the church to see in, and people inside the church to see out. So a giornamento, bringing up to date. But the second word gives us some nuance on that first word, ressourcement, it's French this time. The reforms that happen at Vatican II, they're not just about bringing up to date. They don't just come from the Council Fathers looking at the state of the world and thinking, what can we do to get, sort of get in step with this? The renewal that happens at Vatican II is about going backwards as well. It's about ressourcement, which means resourcing, going back to the sources. It's in French because there was a movement in French theology that also spreads to, to Holland as well. It's, it's about revisiting those early church fathers, revisiting the earliest theology and writings of the church, and kind of mining its richness. Before Vatican II in the kind of the long 19th century, so taken from the end of the, the 1700s, up to the period before Vatican II, Catholic theology is dominated by a very particular understanding of Thomas Aquinas. Thomas Aquinas is used for pretty much everything. And it means that, in some ways, Catholic theology has lost sight of the richness of the, those early church thinkers. So at Vatican II, people are concerned to go back and see what they say. What do they say about the church? What's their liturgy like? 
how can we draw on that richness? So it's renewal by bringing up to date, and it's renewal by going backwards to mining the early, the early church. It's kind of what Pope Benedict calls renewal within tradition. Now those two terms of Giornamento and Resorsmo, they give us two important clues about what the popes and their council fathers thought they were doing. And the other clue emerges during the course of the council discussions themselves, during the sessions. And it's about language. So put very, very simply, one of the biggest changes at Vatican II is a change of tone of voice. Listen to this. Blind that they are, and leaders of the blind, Inflated with a boastful science, they have reached that pitch of folly where they pervert the eternal concept of truth and the true nature of the religious sentiment. With that new system of theirs, they are seen to be under the sway of a blind and unchecked passion for novelty, thinking not at all of finding some solid foundation of truth, but despising the holy and apostolic traditions, they embrace other vain, futile, uncertain doctrines condemned by the church on which, in the height of their vanity, they think they can rest and maintain truth itself. That's Pashendi, so that's the, the anti-modernist, the first anti-modernist in Sigmund that we were talking about earlier on. So that's one term of voice. Okay, so now listen to this. Therefore, the council focuses its attention on the whole world of men, on the whole human family, along with the sum of those realities in the midst of which it lives. That world which is the theatre of man's history and the air of his energies, his tragedies and his triumphs. That world which the Christian sees as created and sustained by its maker's love, fallen indeed into the bondage of sin, yet emancipated now by Christ, who was crucified and rose again to break the stranglehold of personified evil, so that the world might be fashioned anew according to God's design and reach its fulfillment. That's Gaudium et Spes, the second paragraph. It sounds quite different, doesn't it? John O'Malley is a Jesuit who's written a very comprehensive and accessible book about Vatican II, which I recommend to you. It's called What Happened at Vatican II. Talks about the council as a language event. So he says language or tone of voice is one of the huge and very important shifts that happens at the council. Now, when the council fathers met, they didn't start from scratch in determining what it was they wanted to say. They had preparatory documents, so they had kind of a working draft that had been prepared by the curia. These are called schema. And the council fathers overwhelmingly reject the, the preparatory document they have in the church, which is called De Ecclesia, in large measure because of its tone of voice. So one of the bishops describes the document as juridical, triumphal, and clerical in tone. The bishops don't want to denounce the world. They want to address it. They want to explain the church at intra, so to the people within the church, and at extra. They want to explain the nature and the gift of the church to the world. Now this is what John O'Malley says about the comparison between the language of the documents of Vatican II and the language of previous councils and encyclicals. Such a comparison, he says, suggests, indeed, that at stake were almost two different versions of Catholicism from commands to invitations, from laws to ideals, from definition to mystery, from threats to persuasion, from coercion to conscience, from monologue to dialogue, from ruling to serving, from withdrawing to integrated, it goes on, from vertical to horizontal, from exclusion to inclusion, from hostility to friendship, rivalry to partnership, suspicion to trust, from static to ongoing, from passive acceptance to active engagement, from fault finding to appreciation, from prescriptive to principles, from behaviour modification to inner appropriation. Is it just a change in language? Is the church saying essentially the same things but in a different tone of voice? Is that the change that happens at Vatican II? Well, several theologians, and not a few bishops, would say as much, including <coughs> Joseph Ratzinger himself. So, back in 1985, he says, the church changes the medium, but not the message. The message remains eternally the same. And in a sense, of course, that's perfectly correct. The Council Fathers do consider themselves to be articulating the same truths in new language. So, the age-old nature and purpose of the church, but telling it in a way that people can understand. But some of the message changes, too. 
particularly if we compare the period immediately before the council to the period immediately afterwards. There are some really dramatic and quite obvious changes that you'll probably come across later in the series, like the church's change of mind about religious freedom, so the idea that everyone has the freedom to practice whichever religion that they are, or the attitude towards Judaism, for example. And the church really does change its mind on those points. So it's a change of message as well as medium. But there aren't many kind of clear changes like that. Generally, the theological shifts are a little bit less obvious, but that's not to say they're any less important, or they don't really amount to a change at all. There are a number of very important theological shifts. I'm going to go, go on and, and look at a couple of them now. So you'll notice in the quotation that I just gave you from John O'Malley, some of the phrases were highlighted in red, and some of them were highlighted in blue. The red phrases pick out the important shifts that happened in Vatican II in terms of theology of the church, and we'll explore those by having a look at some key themes from Lumen Gentium. And the blue phrases pick out some of the important shifts that happen in terms of that relationship between church and world, and we'll have a look at some of the key themes of Gaudium et Spes that express those changes. So first of all, changes to the theology of the church then. From definition to mystery, from vertical to horizontal, from static to ongoing. I've already said the Council Fathers see their mission as explaining the nature of the church at intra, everyone inside, and at extra to everyone outside. Now, during the Protestant Reformation, Protestant reformers had drawn very much on the idea of the invisible church. So this is the idea that the true church is not identifiable immediately with any particular body of people, but it's something that's known only to God. It's, um, it's a bit like saying that you don't know who the true fans of Celtic Football Club are by looking at the ground, because there are going to be fans who aren't in the ground, and there may be people in the ground who aren't fans. That's the idea of the invisible church. But in response to that idea that you can't tell where the church is just by looking, the Catholic Church emphasizes that the church is visible and that the true church is the Roman Catholic Church, with all its visible institutional structures. There's no true church outside that. If you're not in it, you're not saved. And since the 17th century, theological reflection on the church had been very <coughs> dominated by that idea of an institutional visible structure, by the idea of the church as a, a society as perfecta, a perfect society. So from that preoccupation with institution, it's beginning to shift a little bit before Vatican II. So in 1944, there's an encyclical called Mystici Corporis Christi, a mystical body of Christ. And so it's beginning to talk about the church as a mystical body, as having some kind of invisible quality too. But in some respects, the idea is still quite rigid. There's a, a very strict identification between that mystical body that they're talking about in the encyclical and the Roman Catholic Church as an institution. Um, there's a very famous Protestant theologian called Karl Barth, a reformed theologian, um, who joked at the time that if the Catholic Church is immediately identifiable with a mystical body, then there isn't much mystical about it, is there? But the Council Fathers want to get away from that preoccupation with the Church as an institution. Instead, in the first chapter of Lumen Gentium, they describe the Church as a mystery, a definition of a mystery. And by mystery, they don't mean something kind of obscure and incomprehensible. They're not kind of talking Scooby-Doo sort of mystery. They're using it in the sense of the Greek word, mysterion, mysterion, something mystical, something precious, a shared understanding of the reality of the church, which is made known to us who are in it by divine revelation. So the church is, in, in one sense, only truly knowable. Its true reality is only knowable to the people inside it who are party to that, that divine revelation. <coughs> They want to emphasize that the church is knowable, visible, but at the same time mysterious and invisible, and it's that that leads them to use the language of the church as sacrament as well. But the fact that the church is a mystery for these, for these council fathers means that you can't ever completely understand it, you can't exhaust the riches of the church, and so they use a huge wealth of images for the church. I've just got some down here, field, vineyard, body, temple, Pilgrim people. That first chapter of Lumen Gentium says the church is a mystery and then goes on to use all these different terms. So from a kind of preoccupation with the church's institution, 
I get this blossoming of vocabulary about the church. Now, picking out two of those images that Lim and Gentium uses will help us to see how the other two shifts happen, from vertical to horizontal, <coughs> and from static to ongoing. So the first chapter of Lim and Gentium is called The Mystery of the Church, and it talks about the church as part of the whole story of salvation and God's involvement in human history. But that wasn't always the first chapter. So remember, when the Council of Fathers sit down to discuss, they've already got those preparatory documents. <coughs> and the preparatory document that became Lumen Gentium is, is that De Ecclesia document on the church. And this was the order of the first few chapters. Nature of the church militant, members of the church, necessity of the church for salvation, episcopate as the highest grade of sacrament of orders, bishops, and so on. Now look at this. This is the order of Lumen Gentium. Mystery of the Church, People of God, Hierarchy of Episcopate, Laity, Universal Vocation to Holiness, and so on. So the order is similar, but there's a difference of emphasis here. Lumen Gentium puts the people of God second. So before it discusses the way in which the people of God are differentiated into a hierarchy, into different ministries, talks about the people of God as a whole. Now, it's important to note that Vatican II is not turning the church into a democracy in any way. It affirms that the hierarchical, hierarchical structure of the church is established by Christ, ruled by Christ. But instead of placing the emphasis always on that vertical structure of hierarchy and command, it also places emphasis on the horizontal equality of the church, the people of God different ministries, one people. So it talks about the universal priesthood of all the faithful, and the way in which the whole people of God participates in the guiding of the church into the fullness of the truth through the, what's called the census fidei. So it's not quite going from vertical to horizontal, I wouldn't go quite that far, but there's a, a balancing of emphasis here. I want to talk a little bit more about the equality of the people of God as a whole. That leaves us with static to ongoing. If you look at official Catholic ecclesiology before Vatican II, one of the things that you might notice is that the church is perceived as very static and unchanging, as I said at the beginning. Behind that is, is sort of the idea, and I am caricaturing here for emphasis, that Jesus had in his mind the idea of the church as he wanted it, pretty much exactly as it existed in the 19th century, and he passed it down through Pope, bishops, and so on, up to the present day. And we can detect that kind of ecclesiological emphasis on the unchanging nature of the church behind some of the statements that Pius X condemns in that encyclical we looked at earlier, Lamentabili. So he's condemning these, remember. The organic constitution of the church is not immutable. Like, hum like human society, Christian society is subject to a perpetual evolution. Big note to that. Dogmas, sacraments, and hierarchy, both their notion and reality, are only interpretations of evolutions of the Christian intelligence, which have increased and perfected by an external series of additions, the little germ latent in the gospel. Big note to that. So those things haven't developed, I want to say. Simon Peter never even suspected that Christ entrusted the primacy of the church to him. Big note. The Roman church became the head of all the churches, not through the ordinance of divine providence, but merely through political conditions. And in those statements, we can see a general desire to defend against the idea that the church has developed or changed, and also a desire to defend the, against the idea that the current form of the church, its institutional structure, owes anything to the, to the pressures, the forces, the vagaries of history. Now, Vatican II does not come out and say that Jesus never intended there to be a church, that it's just all been a historical accident. They affirm that the church hands on a gift that it genuinely does receive from Christ and that it preserves through the ages. But there's a new emphasis on the church as a movement, as a pilgrim people of God. So they admit the church isn't perfect. It will reach perfection and fulfillment only in heaven. This is Lumen Gentium 48. The church to which we are all called in Christ Jesus and in which we acquire sanctity through the grace of God will attain its full perfection only in the glory of heaven, when there will come the time of the restoration of all things. So 
So the church is kind of it's like a procession almost. It's on the way somewhere. And instead of dividing the church, as, as Dea Ecclesia does, into the church militant and the church triumphant, so that those of us who are still here on earth battling away, and those who have kind of got there in heaven, they switch to a metaphor of journey. So it's one continuous pilgrim people of God, but some of us are on the way in Via, which is a very Thomas Aquinas way of talking about it. And some people have got there, they've got the vision of God. So it's that switch to ongoing from static. And in Gadamet's phase, the church want father, the council fathers want to want to affirm that the council, they want to affirm that the world, as well as the church, is the object of God's love. So it's not just the church as a lifeboat, the world is the object of God's love. And that the church is part of the world's life and history. So the church is part of the world's journey, the world is part of the church's journey. And Gaudi met space opened with these, these well-known words which you've probably heard before. The joys and the hopes, the griefs and the anxieties of the men of this age, especially those who are poor or in any way afflicted, these are the joys and hopes, the griefs and anxieties of the followers of Christ. Indeed, nothing genuinely human fails to raise an echo in that. For theirs is a community composed of men, united in Christ, they're led by the Holy Spirit in their journey, journey again, to the kingdom of their Father, and they have welcomed the news of salvation which is meant for every man. This is why this community realize, realizes that it is truly linked with mankind and its history by the deepest of bonds. So from that idea of the church as a little lifeboat that kind of repels the world, that tries to keep the world out, that rescues people from the world and delivers them to heaven. We've now got the idea of the church as truly linked with mankind and its history by the deepest of bonds. And that brings us neatly to looking at some of the changes that happen at Vatican II in the relationship between the church and the world and that Gaudium et Spes document. <coughs> so we've already noted that there's a, a significant change in the way that the world is being addressed here. So we've got dialogue instead of monologue. It's not telling the, the world that it's wrong and that the church has all the answers. <coughs> the tone is more dialogical. It's, we have a gift for you. We want you to receive it. We see that you need it. And instead of sort of condemnation or threats of damnation, it moves to persuasion. It's kind of, look here, we have the fullness of life. Come on in. And that change of language signifies a change in relationship too. So from withdrawn to integrated from hostility to friendship. <clears throat> Gaudi met space shifts that kind of lifeboat image of the church. It says salvation is meant for everyone. Salvation is meant for every man, it says. And the church is called to be a sacrament of salvation, so it witnesses to the world at large, bringing them that truth of the gospel, enlightening them about the true vocation of humanity, and humanity's essential unity. But although there's that shift towards engagement, towards friendship, towards invitation, the Second Vatican Council isn't completely positive about the world. So the tone is very affirming and very friendly. But when you read the document of Gaudium et Spes quite closely, you'll notice that just about every time it says something affirming about the world, it balances it with a sort of cautionary note. So it affirms human dignity and human potential, it speaks very warmly. But it also recognises that human beings have a, a very deeply rooted tendency to seek the, the goal of their existence, their kind of raison d'etre outside God. And it notes that it's a very rapid pace of progress that's going on in the modern world. But it also notes that that's left people feeling a great deal of uncertainty. The uncertainty of the modern age comes quite strongly through Gaudium and Spes. And it recognises modern advances in science, technology and economics and the huge potential that they have. They have potential for human flourishing, but it also recognises that they could quite easily go the opposite way. So Gaudium and Spes affirms what is good in the world, but it also sees its task in terms of channeling all that progress, all that potential, to a fuller understanding of the good of the individual human being, the good of the human race as a whole, <coughs> and that fuller understanding given by the gospel. So this is Gaudium et Spes. Christ's church, trusting in the design of the creator, 
acknowledges that human progress can serve man's true happiness, yet she cannot help echoing the Apostle's warning, be not conformed to this world. All human activity, constantly imperiled by man's pride and deranged self-love, must be purified and perfected by the power of Christ's cross and resurrection. So there is a shift in relationship between the church and the world. It moves from hostility to friendship, from monologue to dialogue. It is a real shift here. But it's not unequivocal. There's ambivalence here. I've underlined it for you in a big red part there to underline that this is the relationship with the world shifts, but they're also a little bit cagey. They want to bring the world into the fullness of the understanding that the church has about how the world is meant to be, how the human person is really meant to be. So kind of beginning to, to wrap things up a bit, does Vatican II give us a modern church in the modern world? Is that what it aims to do? Yes and no. And if you ask any theologian any question, they will almost always say yes and no. Yes and no, but on balance, I think I might have to say probably not. I don't think Vatican II gives us a modern church in a modern world. And I'm not sure that's entirely what it aimed to do. So it certainly aims to update the church, so a giornamento, but through going backwards, through resource law, and bringing to light all the riches of the church's history and, and liturgy and theology. And in doing that, it gives us a much richer theology of the church, so we retrieve all those different images for a church. We no longer think of the church as an institution, we think of it as a mystery. And it aimed to throw open the windows of the church, letting us see out, letting other people see in. And in doing that, it becomes a sort of little Pentecost. So the church leaves the little room where it's been hiding in fear of the modern world. And it goes out to, to meet the world, to speak the same language as the world, and to give the world the message of the gospel. And it gives that message in ways that are challenging as well as affirming. So I think on balance, I would say, Vatican II didn't so much enable the church to become modern as it did enable the church to become present. Present to the joys, the hopes, the griefs, the anxieties, those opening words of God in that space. Really present to those, listening to them, discerning the signs of the times. It enabled the church to be present for the world of the 1960s, that world of rapid progress, but present too for, for the world of today as well. And that leads me to uh, a few thoughts about, about where we are now in this French cartoon. And in these anniversary years of the Council, there's a huge amount of discussion of the Council and a huge amount of discussion of the signs of the times, so the church's context today. And quite often, the result goes something like this, and I'll expect to see some of you nodding if you've heard this too. At Vatican II, the Council Fathers were too optimistic about the world. So they opened up the church to the world a little bit too much, and as the cartoon jokes, everyone left. So vocations and nosedived in Europe, mass attendance is dropping, the church has lost respect, lost influence. The world is a much more hostile place with <coughs> aggressive secularism, and Christianity is now the most persecuted religion in our world. It's just a kind of general disrespect for the church's moral guidance. And in light of those signs of the times, some people say, well, it's time to rebalance that into his optimism, that kind of engagement of Gaudiumet space. It's time to shut those windows that were opened at the castle and protect ourselves a bit. Whenever I hear that story, I want to say two things. And the first is, don't blame Vatican II. I don't think the council fathers are over optimistic about the world. They want to be for the world. But what they really see is the church's potential, potential that there is for human flourishing. They see human beauty, and they want to do everything they can to bring that into the light of the gospel. But they, they don't have their eyes shut to the, the difficult aspects of the world, the potential for all this progress to go the wrong way. The agency of the in this space are very balanced documents. And the second thing I always want to say is that Vatican II, when you really read Gaudi in space closely, gives us some very good advice. And it's the same advice that John Paul II gave when he first came out onto the balcony in his first speech when he was elected. And it's do not be afraid. 
That is what Gandhi meant space is about. Not so much being modern as not being afraid of. It's not about the world being great, it's about the church having the gospel, having the good news, not being afraid anymore. And just to quote St. Paul, it says, For I am convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. And if that being unafraid is really the central message of gathering in space, then that, I think, is something really worth holding on to and worth reminding ourselves about in this anniversary. Thank you. It's a very convincing presentation, and of course more convincing because it's a woman speaking in a modern church, which in my generation we didn't have that. We rarely have ever heard a woman speaking church. But I think isn't Vatican II really an attempt by the church to move on from an old elite terracy, you know, the hierarchical structure we have kept the ignorant masses, ill-educated and whatnot, in their place because heavens will be anarchy if you let them think things. So you used ethnicity, class, status, politics, identity to keep people in the church. Think of Poland, think of Ireland, think of American immigrants. You kept them loyal to the church. But by the time we get to Vatican II, you have a changed social order in which the society is entirely social democratic. And the old authoritarian structures are beginning to crumble, whether it's Nazism, Stalin, dead, Franco's on the back foot, and so on. And all the people we're talking about here are theologians who've come through a social democratic experience. American, Belgian, French, German. I mean, well, we were some British theologians, but, uh, you know, it's a changed atmosphere. And I think that's the key to this change, that they're running to keep up with um, an optimistic world in which people will think for themselves and also significantly live much longer than their children, uh, sorry, their fathers and mothers and grandchildren, uh, grandfathers. And, you know, like now we're all paying more money for pensions and so on because we're all living on. In those days when you were talking about, <coughs> excuse me, modernism, people were dying by the time they were 40 or 50. You know, if you live beyond it's that, really yes, yeah, 1900, 1900. It's, it's later than that, it's Yeah, from uh, mod 20th, modernism, so. I know, but I mean, you think again of First World War and Second World War, chances of survival were pretty thin, particularly on the Eastern Front. Uh, you know, so that death was never a present concept, but since 45, life has been rosy, optimistic, you will live for a long time, by and large, and therefore you're going to have more choices. And you know, you're going to have divorce, you're going to have changes, you're going to have more people going to higher education, and to college and university, more critical of this static order, and rejecting it. And the problem is, as your little cartoon show, that's what happens. Over to you. Now, do you remember what I said about how theologians answer questions? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes and no. So, yes, there is a huge amount of social change in the period that you're describing. And for a long time, the church reacts to it in much the same way as it does when those developments start to impact on theology. So you can tell a parallel story. So the story I told about modernism, how these different theological ideas were coming up and they got squashed. You can tell the same story about ideas about freedom of religion, ideas about of democracy. So, Polis, um, I think it's the ninth, I think it's the ninth, uh, produces this syllabus of errors, which is about condemning the kind of social unrest and upheaval that happens as a result of things like the French Revolution, where societies are beginning, beginning to become democratic, beginning to become radically at odds with the kind of structure that operates in the church. But, and this is the no part of the question, part of my answer. If we're going to ask the question, what happened at Vatican II? A lot of the key shifts in this kind of stuff happened before Vatican II. So if you look at changes to, say, ideas of the apostles and the lay people, those key shifts are already in place in the 1930s. In terms of theology of the laity, not much 
tablets are that I can do. Everyone just rubber stamps it, they think it's great. And it's because the church is already responding to some of the some of the changes that have happened in terms of letting people have to do more in the church, so things like Catholic action, young Christian workers that arise in the 1930s. Church is already recognizing the contribution that those bring, and also that they need them because they're running out of priests, and especially now in areas they can't cope anymore. They know that they need to shift what they're doing to deal with these kind of urban masses of people who have never heard of the church, because everyone's flocking to the cities, there's not enough priests to cover it. So yes, those are the changes that you're describing happen, but in large measure, the church has responded to them before Vatican II, but well, 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 well. <laughs> <laughs> but you're also right that uh, Vatican II picks up on the general, I hesitate to say optimism because I do read a strong strain of ambivalence going through that. They see all this progress, but there's as much uncertainty as, as optimism there about that, that progress. You know, the point I'm making really is that before Vatican II, insofar as it's a lay activism, it's always looking over its shoulder. Is that right, my lord? Is that right, father? And so it's a very closely defined and controlled it's, it's environment. It's under control, <coughs> control of yeah. So that it's very slow to develop independent uh, initiatives. I mean, there are one or two exemplary people like Dorothy Day, who, who breaks out and becomes an out and out pacifist and social uh, movement person. But by and large, that's unique. You know, it was not a, a mass movement of that sort. And I'm thinking in particular of Henri de Lubac. He was a soldier of the Great War. Henri de Lubac is a great Jesuit theologian, and he's very much at the forefront of that resource model. So he's the person that, that goes back and retrieves all this artistic theology. But in a way, it's almost the opposite of what you suggest. It's not quite an optimism about, we're going to live a long time, and we don't have a war, it's great. It's, it's much less that, and more a kind of, a nostalgia for a romantic age, in the same way that J.R.R. Tolkien, who's in the same period, is trying to create, kind of create this romantic bygone age by, by looking back to, to these myths and, and creating a sort of pristine time. So there's, there's multiple dynamics going on in the period that we're talking about. A very hierarchical and authoritarian uh, organisation can ever actually adapt to what the government has described as a, as a social democratic type. I mean, I'm reminded of no doubt you know that uh, likes to talk to you about Martin, democracy in America, the most dangerous time for an authoritarian organization is when it relaxes just a little, because goodness knows what might happen, you know, the, the top of the kettle could be blown off. And I just wonder if there would be people, perfectly well-intentioned people within the Catholic Church, who saw that as the, as, as the danger, that, you know, if you relax your structures and your approach, everything could be destroyed. There's significant rebalancing going on. And if you read, um, I think it's the last chapter of Lumen Gentium, which, which chapters that deal with papal primacy and, and the collegiality of the bishops, there's a strong contingent at Vatican II that wants to counterbalance what happened at Vatican I. So at Vatican I, the Pope had just lost all the papal lands. And what he wants to do is say, okay, I have no temporal power left, you know what? I'm going to have all the spiritual power I can get. And so that's when we <coughs> see the infallibility being defined in the 1870s. Um, and because there was a very strong centralization on the Pope from that period, Vatican II, they kind of want to counterbalance that a little bit by talking more about collegiality. But at the same time, as you say, there's another strong contingent that's very worried about ceding control from the papacy, ceding power from the papacy. They want to preserve a very strong role of the Pope. Um, one theologian has done a fascinating study of, of that, textual study of that bit of Lumen Gentium. Because you can actually go through with Tipex, and if you took out all the statements that kind of reaffirm the authority of the Pope, you have a text that flows beautifully. If you put them back in, you have something that's a little bit clunky, but it's balanced. So you can see that all the time the fathers are kind of negotiating about, about how to strike that proper balance between, between collegiality and privacy. So it's rebalanced, but maybe to an extent. The people who live by the law, which everybody was doing, they're always terrified of freedom because they imagine, they cannot imagine a world where people think for themselves, they're terrified of they're terrified to release the energy and so they want to keep everything 
tied down and under control. They're being left themselves at the level of the law, which is an immature position from a moral point of view. And I would suggest to you that the Second Vatican Council is part of a much, much bigger move in history. But what's happening here is that with the enlightenment, humanity enters into its adolescence. It goes through all the stages of adolescence go through. And what that leads to in the end, if the process works properly, is mature moral thinking, where we don't need to live by rules and regulations. It doesn't mean that our behavior changes, but our reason for why we what to do what we do changes. We learn to live by, by moral principles. We, 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 we take to ourselves things that we did before because we were told to. And, and that the Second Vatican Council is part of a whole movement in history. That as we move into the third millennium, the challenge is to human maturity. And, and, and that's, where, that's where the future lies. It's only if we can do that that we'll move beyond the, the wars and the violence and the, and the xenophobia and the isolationism that we're seeing again going on around us at the moment. That will only happen if we can grow to human maturity, which is what the kingdom of God is about. So it's, it, it's part of a much, much bigger movement, and it's going to take a long time. Post-modernity, which is what the world was going into just as Vatican II was kind of catching up on modernity, um, is a little bit less optimistic about that kind of narrative of human progress. I want to pick up on, um, on the things you said about morals. Now, Vatican II doesn't have a document on moral theology. It's got documents on all kinds of things, but not moral theology. But nevertheless, it creates huge changes in moral theology, and it is to do with exactly the kind of thing Joe's talking about, which is encouraging people to have moral maturity. So previously, moral theology is taught in seminaries, it's taught using manuals, and the idea of these manuals is to train priests to make confessions. So the people doing moral theology are priests, and these manuals are just designed to kind of help you identify what kind of sin is being committed, so there's lots of fine distinctions between different kinds of sin and, and what we should do about it, kind of penance. And it's almost like they were training priests as sort of doctors. So you, the patient, are not meant to have kind of an overall view. You just come with this problem like, Father, I've done so and so, and, and I'll tell you what to do. Now, what Vatican II does is slightly different. Let's see if I can find my, my notes from John and Adam. But he talks about moving from prescription to principle. So instead of kind of offering people just condemnations. We give people principles, we can appeal to them. We can appeal to, it's a matter of where I am. <laughs> so it, it is about encouraging people to have a kind of moral maturity and to take decisions for themselves, from laws to ideals. So there is that move from <coughs> telling people about specific moral laws that they must have contravened to saying, this is the ideal. So instead of just presenting yourself to the priest slash doctor and saying, Father, I've got this problem, what do I do about it? There's more of a shift towards an understanding of the whole human person and the whole vocation of holiness of every individual. It's just a very more holistic understanding of moral theology. Can I just add to that from my point ago that that doesn't just appeal to counsel. All the, all the, the psychological insights of the 20th century, all point in the point of the same direction. These are not, you don't have to have faith to see this. All the studies that have been done on how human beings develop morally. Yeah. Um, from coercion to principle. That's going on with Mormon Father the yeah. Church. It's, it's, it's part of the modern movement. It's part of the reason why people today want to think for themselves, why people are so reluctant to accept authority, because it's part of that movement. At the moment, it's at that, it's at its adolescent stage. But out of that will we'll develop a more virtue of humanity. It's obviously the spirit of God is guiding that That's why it will happen. But the other part of it, of course, is, is the whole question of faith and religion. That part of this movement is called a personal relationship with God. People here are fed up listening to me talking about that. But a lot of these great theologians that we talk about, they've been telling us for years that the only people who will survive in the church of the future are people who have a personal relationship with God. And that's why they all shot out when the door open. Because somebody, somebody opened the prison gates and they all left. The only people who will stay are the people who have a personal relationship with God. Who are there because they want to do that. Not 
because they're broken in there. And it's a, it's a massive movement of the government. It's, it's so important that we understand that it seems to be part of something very, very big. 